Meg Lunsager is a public policy fellow with the Kennan Institute and a former executive with the International Monetary Fund. And William Pomeranz is deputy director of that same Wilson Center Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies. And they join us for this edition of Now. Thanks for being here. We're going to be talking about sanctions. Thank you. And if we can, we'll do a little bit of a replay of the major event that the Kennan Institute hosted last week. Well, tell us about that. Well, we had a grant from the Henry M. Jackson Foundation to discuss the role of sanctions in U.S. foreign policy. But since it's become such a big topic, and since it, uh, especially in light of the Russian sanctions, but also the debates over Cuba and over Iran, we thought it was timely to look both in the past and in the future. And so we had a long discussion about the historical evolution of sanctions, how they've been applied to specific countries, and what role in the future they, sanctions could play in U.S. statecraft. Meg, you were one of the panelists for yeah. this event. And I'm always curious, you know, we, we, there are certain things, we think we all understand them and are talking about the same thing, but then when we begin to unravel it, as you did during this event, maybe you find out that there's not so much agreement. So I'm wondering in that context, were there things that you learned that were different than what you'd previously thought? There, were there things you heard you disagreed with or agreed with? If you just give us some of your reactions to well, the, it, the opinions. It, it was really interesting to hear the perspective of the different speakers because uh, in terms of the effectiveness of sanctions, a uh, number of speakers spoke about overcompliance, where you may have a very narrow set of sanctions, but the business community, because it fears perhaps inadvertently stepping over into illegal activity, broadens the, you know, the wall and refuses to do any business so with any... So sort of a cover your butt approach. Yeah, to get very... And you get huh. overcompliance and you get a much broader impact. And some of the debate was, was that intended by those imposing the sanctions, which some people felt it was, and others felt, no, not necessarily, because we've moved into a world of smart sanctions, where sanctions are targeted more often now at particular entities or individuals engaging in the behavior that uh, we're seeking change. A, a little bit more about this notion of smart sanctions. So you, you can just have less residual impact? You can target specific types of economic activity? Is that what we're talking about? But that's the intent. That you can target specific sectors of the economy. And that's sectors. really been the goal of the Russian sanctions, that it's, it's targeted uh, the energy sector, especially oil exploration in the Arctic, and it specifically targeted Russia's financial sector mm -hmm. by, make, by essentially closing off Western financing to Russian state and companies. So less unintended consequences as far as who feels the burden of the sanctions? L less global sanctions, as it were. Not uh -huh. kind of a whole gl a global sanctions on all imports and exports from a particular country, for example. There's still plenty of trade that goes on with Russia. It's only specific sectors that are sanctioned. And the specific sectors are sanctioned uh, in order to try to address the underlying reason for those sanctions. I want to ask both of you uh, to think historically about sanctions and if you were going to provide one example of where you think they really worked. And even if you, it, it, you turn up with the same example, we can, uh, we can talk about that. But w what would be an example historically where we got it right, we did it the right way, the context was right, it was effective, and we had a, a desirable outcome? I think one of the interesting aspects of the conference was the discussion of South African sanctions because the impression was we got it wrong for 16 years or 17 years and then in the last year actually it was right. Mm -hmm. So it emphasized the notion that sanctions are introduced over time uh, and that sometimes you need to let them work in order to be effective and get to the result that you want. Let them work and adjust them along the way? Yes, and that was one of the uh, comments some of the speakers made in terms of Iran that the sanctions were ramped up to get uh, more pressure on the Iranians to come to the table to negotiate on the, uh, the nuclear deal, which hopefully will be concluded uh, by June. And there was a sense, I think, among a number of the speakers that, that that had worked, the escalation had worked in bringing them to the table. So that was the assumption, that, that it was a motivating factor for the Iranian no negotiators because to deal with the sanctions. It was, a f it was a motivating factor. I think one of the things that came out in the conference is that they don't necessarily serve as deterrence. If you think that sanctions are going to solve all the issues mm -hmm. of an action, then you're probably overestimating the impact so of then what, sanctions. So what do they do? Do they create a better environment for negotiations? They, uh, the goal would be to bring the opposing side to the table. And what was emphasized by several of the speakers was when you impose sanctions, you need to have a clear objective and you need to know what you actually want to obtain. And that sometimes you can't obtain everything that you want, but you need to know when you've gotten enough. And that is when you can decide to lessen sanctions. So Russia, Russia. L let's talk about the attempts to use sanctions to influence the behavior of Russia. What is your initial assessment of how that's working out? 
Well, the initial assessment is if, if you think it's going to change, lead to regime change, that's not going to happen. I mean, the view was, I think, 100 percent shared that, you know, President Putin is not at all going but to... But that's not the goal. That's not the goal. And the goal is to really make the cost of Russia taking these actions in Ukraine higher and higher. So in a certain respect, there was some discussion of the deterrent effect of sanctions. By starting to impose sanctions, uh, the rest of us, whether it's Europe, U.S., uh, the G7, are signaling that we're ready to take additional steps if you don't behave in Ukraine and meet the Minsk Accords. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's that message as well to uh, try and prevent further escalation. So in this case, would you think that, based, based on what Meg describes, it's not to try to get Russia to completely change course and withdraw immediately, but more to make them think twice about any similar movements or escalation? I think that was part of the calculation. And I think one of the things that the ambassador, Ambassador Fried mentioned, was, you know, the unknown unknown uh, unknowables. And that is, you know, this is what we know what Russia did, but what would Russia might have done if no sanctions had been imposed? Would have it in fact felt free to go further into eastern Ukraine? Would have marched all the way to Kiev, for example? Um, it's unclear and it's very hard to say what didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But in the case for the Russian sanctions, there have been moments where Russia has clearly paused to th rethink its position. And at each, each time at that, at that stage, uh, sanctions have been imposed or raised. So it's interesting to see. Meg, you mentioned the so-called notion of smart sanctions, an evolving approach to how sanctions mm -hmm. are administered. What, with the changing global economy and in more and more interconnectedness almost by the hour, uh, does that create a, a more difficult or complicated uh, environment for imposing sanctions, or does that actually uh, provide more tools? I think it makes it much more complicated, and this was one of the points I made in using the example of the recent cybersecurity executive order uh, released by the uh, White House recently, targeting those that are using uh, the Internet, using um, cyber weapons to undermine either our infrastructure, computer systems, financial systems, which of course is a fear we all have. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I worry a bit that the sanctions, depending on how they're applied, and none have been applied yet, uh, may deter legitimate users of the U.S. business community, whether it's the financial sector or certainly our technology sector, because both of those are real strengths of the U.S. economy, and we want to make sure legitimate business still is welcomed in the United States. So smart sanctions, I think, will have to be very smart to be careful not to have those definitely unintended genius consequences level of smart. genius <laughs> level <laughs> sanctions, yes. Quick final thought, Will, people, if they want more information, I know that you had a webcast of we have, the event. We have webcast, and we'll put that on our website uh, shortly. And I think what really came out was just uh, the unique role that sanctions will now play going forward. Uh, and the question is, you know, will they become the default provision? Uh, or will we have to think long and hard before we reach the sanctions? I think one of the emphasis, uh, again, of the speakers was it shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction simply to turn to sanctions, and that sometimes the best solution is not to impose sanctions. Hmm. And that was another very revealing in part In life of the and in international relations, Indeed. sometimes the best yes. solution is do nothing. Right? <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.